Well, thank you. Whoop. I got it. Zoom recording is going. All right. Uh, so thank you uh, so much, uh, in particular, to the organizers uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a real, real honor to be part of the this uh, seminar series. Uh, there's a particularly uh, uh, large set of names associated with the seminar series. So it's an honor to be part of those names. And it's uh, been fun watching the waiting room uh, roll in and, and seeing so many people that uh, I know personally. And so seeing some friendly faces that I haven't interacted with in a while, given COVID and the Atlantic. And uh, it'll be great to interact with a number of you that uh, I don't uh, previously know. So I just wanted to take this opportunity today, not so much to evangelize the use of, of carbon-14 with, with beryllium-10 uh, in terms of cosmogenic nuclide chronologies, but present some of some thinking that I've been doing recently about trying to do more with less. Um, you know, we're so focused in the surface exposure dating community on precise chronologies. And many of us, myself included, spend a lot of time trying to explain why we may have uh, a less than precise uh, uh, answer than we would have ideally had. So I want to talk about some application in the glacial environment and then in the arid desert type environment. So I have to thank all of my collaborators on this, a uh, long list of them here. Um, more or less, these represent uh, two papers. Uh, that one came out last year in um, Journal of Geophysical Research, uh, and the other, if uh, you are so inclined, and I'm in the process of revising, is on uh, geochronology discussions, so I definitely encourage you to check that out. I uh, got to thank the Accelerator Labs, um, and then two PhD students that were really instrumental in helping me out uh, with the field work and, and making some of these measurements, but they've got their own fantastic sets of papers, uh, and Rachel is actually defending her dissertation next week, so she'll have some fun uh, and exciting papers coming out in the near future. So, as many of you are aware, and I do apologize if you're not as familiar with surface exposure dating, I'm happy to, to clarify any points that may come out of it. It has been transformational in, uh, I guess, about the last 30 years now in geomorphology, broadly defined. And one of the primary applications has been the chronology of moraine and other associated glacial deposits. So this is a, a figure from a recent review paper by Greg Balco, uh, and it's just showing the latitudinal distribution of the application of exposure dated landforms. Now, and this is just uh, really globally, but with a major focus along uh, the Cordilleras of um, North and South America. And in all cases, they're trying to go for one, an accurate age. We, of course, want an accurate age of this landform, but also a precise age. And for a variety of reasons that we're going to try and touch on, um, oftentimes this chronology is not as precise as uh, we, being the global we as a community, would uh, necessarily like. The other thing that's happened in, in the last 30 years is the widespread application and measurement of primarily beryllium-10, um, but other nuclides as well, um, in terms of catchment scale erosion rates, as well as focusing on individual uh, landforms for understanding the erosion rate of those surfaces or those landscapes. And in this case, they are often tied with the transport history of the sediment from which beryllium-10 or any other cosmogenic nuclide is being measured. And so we really want to start to probe what is the actual sediment transport history and what can we glean in terms of that transport history from cosmogenic nuclide studies. So if we first focus on moraine chronologies, this is just a fantastic uh, doublet of moraines in Western Norway that I've had a chance to work on. Um, we see that we in, in terms of, and this is in terms of concentration uh, rather than age, so just be aware of that. We see a multimodal distribution. And you know, in a perfect world, this would be a, a single modal, more Gaussian type distribution. But we perhaps aren't all that surprised because if we look at the form of these two moraines, we see that they are fundamentally different. One is composed almost entirely of uh, rather large interlocked boulders, while the other is uh, quite a bit more smooth um, and uh, 
less represented by boulders and more represented by sediments, but you can see embedded boulders. And so it's perhaps not unsurprising that we have differences, uh, assuming these, these age differences between these moraines are quite small. Um, it's not it's perhaps not that surprising that we have differences in the resulting beryllium 10 concentration in this case and in the resulting exposure age that's associated with it. A different way to look at it, and these PDFs, by the way, have, have now more or less saturated the literature. A different way to look at it is just in a good old fashioned box and whisker plot. And if we take this box and whisker plot approach, we actually end up taking more of a, a macroscopic view of the problem. And we perhaps wouldn't say that we have issues associated with either inheritance or post-depositional processes associated with this moraine. So we have to look at things uh, or, or the uh, our sense of what we want to get out of our study is oftentimes linked with um, the scale at which we are addressing the problem. Are we looking for the most precise chronology possible, or are we okay with a little bit more fuzziness? And this really holds true uh, not only for moraines, but also in this case, alluvial fan chronologies. And this is largely inspired by, by work done by, by Kurt Frankel um, and many other people, but Kurt, uh, I just borrowed his figure here, um, where they are trying to get at um, the most precise chronology for these alluvial fan surfaces of a variety of ages in order to derive fault slip rates. Um, and this inspires and motivates a lot of the work in southwestern portions of the United States where we have active tectonics. But unsurprisingly, the nature of alluvial fans and where the sediment is derived from means that uh, uh, quite often we have chronologies that are less than ideal. So this is, uh, these are a couple of figures from Patrick Applegate that, that many of you probably recognize. Um, thinking about what are the influences on potential exposure ages, in this case from a moraine, but also uh, equally applies to an alluvial fan surface. And so we can think about, in this case, just the histogram of exposure ages, uh, parent ages on, on the x-axis. Um, and what we can see are two distinct skewnesses. We have a negative skew where we have post-depositional degradation of the moraine, and that could lead to uh, progressive exhumation, for example, of a boulder out of a moraine, and so that the exposure age is not necessarily tracking the depositional age, but rather tracking when that sampled surface first popped out of um, the matrix of the moraine itself. We can also think about a positive skew situation or a right skewed situation where we have inheritance and we have nuclides in the samples that we are working with that were derived prior to or accumulated prior to deposition on or in the moraine surface. And in reality, we have a continuum here because any individual boulder on a moraine or on an alluvial fan is subject to these two processes. In a perfect world, we would have something that represents a Gaussian distribution where that the only spread in the resulting exposure ages or concentrations are purely a byproduct of the uncertainty associated with the measurement. The reality is, and I think what we have to start questioning as a community, is should we actually expect a Gaussian age distribution for a landform? Right, And this is really beyond the scope of this talk, but it's just a thought I want to put out in the community in that should we expect a pure Gaussian where in this case um, the reduced chi-square value approximates one and that only accounts um, for the spread as a result of analytical uncertainty. So just putting that out there, we're going to kind of touch on it, but really we're going to move on to a slightly uh, different topic. So to do that, we're going to work with carbon-14. There are a number of carbon-14 labs now coming online. This just happens to be mine. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a distinctly different uh, extraction process uh, from beryllium in that rather doing, uh, than doing a chemical dissolution, we're actually doing a fusion of the sample. Um, and we subsequently cryogenically collect that gas and measure it uh, via AMS. So they're not 
uh, nearly as abundant as a beryllium lab, but the good news is there's a number of labs online or coming online in Europe. Same thing in North America, uh, also in Australia. I believe Korea has a lab or two now. So what my hope is, is that as a community, we can start to interrogate uh, new questions um, and, and potentially messy data and try to learn more than what we may have in the past if we can start using C14 a bit more. So just to get everybody on the same page, I want to talk a little bit about systematics and review everybody's favorite paired nuclide plot or, or the banana diagram. Um, Carbon-14 has a very short half-life relative to beryllium-10, just over 5,000 years. And consequently, um, the accumulation systematics of any nuclide um, are to a first order controlled by the half-life of that nuclide. And so for carbon-14, the time scale of saturation is short relative to every other cosmogenic nuclide on the order, pardon me, on the order of 30 to 35,000 years approximately. It's produced by spallation processes at a rate about three times that of beryllium. And what's really interesting is that in most places globally, about 20% of the surface production is by, uh, done by muons rather than spallation processes. And this has important implications and consequences for the resulting signal that might be measured And this is done in the uh, North American paradigm of banana plots rather than the, uh, uh, the European paradigm. Either one are perfectly acceptable. And I do apologize. I just got an unstable internet connection warning. So hopefully I'm coming through okay. Um, we have in this case the normalized um, <clears throat> carbon 14 to beryllium 10 ratio. Um, we are showing the uh, field of stability. And in this case, a sample that is not eroding and accumulating both nuclides would move down this slope down and to the right as exposure age or exposure time increases. Saturation would be out at a point about here where my laser pointer is. And so samples that were continuously exposed accumulating nuclides would plot where these yellow stars are located. Samples that were continuously exposed, uh, but eroding and, and accumulating nuclides would plot in this uh, gray field. And then if a sample underwent complex exposure, either one period of burial or multiple periods of burial and exposure, they would plot in this lower field. The forbidden zone, uh, I forget who this was, was termed by, um, is perhaps not so forbidden anymore in the field of carbon-14 and beryllium-10. And this is fascinating work uh, done by my students, Terry Rand and Tori Kennedy. So I encourage everybody to check out their work. But there are some unique scenarios where you can find yourself in the forbidden zone due to erosion um, and the influence of nuance. So what I want to do is talk about a few case studies where processes prior or post deposition challenges um, our ability to develop accurate and precise chronologies. So the first place I want to go is the Gray Hunter Massif uh, in the Yukon Territory. That's the orange star uh, in the north. And then the latter place I want to explore is work we've been doing in the Anza Borrego Desert of California. So we're going to go to the shaking star first. And there's been uh, quite a lot of interest uh, in the chronology of the Cordilleran ice sheet. Um, it is a wonderful place to work. It is a challenging place to work um, as a consequence of processes active today in the post-glacial and paraglacial landscape, but also due to processes active during ice cover uh, by the Cordilleran ice sheet. So this is uh, a nice paper by Arjen Stroven. Um, looking at a, a range of moraines and features in these yellow boxes, but it is characterized in some cases by very nice tightly clustered ages um, on the McConnell or, or kind of classically considered MIS2 moraines. Um, but by and large, and this is not a, a knock at all on, on Aryan and, and collaborators, it is characterized by, by a wide distribution of ages. All right. And so if we are to look at the Cordilleran ice sheet 
to assess its response to paleoclimate change, um, largely in an effort to apply those learnings um, to places like Greenland because of, it, of some of its similarities glaciologically, we really need to understand the chronology associated with these glacial features, whether that be uh, eroded bedrock or moraine deposits. Um, but right now, um, from the purely beryllium perspective, we have some challenges, all right? We, we wanna see if we can look through the noise to a certain degree. And, you know, really it's hard. It's hard in this region. And part of that is because we have complex topography that controls the ice flow conditions present um, affecting the landscape. Uh, and I apologize for the blurriness of this figure, um, but modeling studies also show that there were broad swaths if you look at the the hashed areas of this ice sheet reconstruction by uh julian singuino um that there are broad swaths of uh the landscape where ice was not sliding across it um so this we would refer to as cold based ice and it would be generally non or minimally erosive and this is what really poses our challenges we have a landscape that may not entirely be reset by uh, Cordillera and ice sheet cover. And then we have a landscape that has active permafrost deflation uh, acting today and very likely in the past. And so we're gonna come back and touch on both of those. So to get our bearings a bit more, uh, the Gray Hunter Massif um, is uh, located north of Whitehorse, Yukon Territory. For reference, Juneau, Alaska is down here. Anchorage is over here, the Gulf of Alaska. Seattle, uh, my hometown would be somewhere uh, down to the south. And what we see um, in, this, in this red box, which is the uh, Gray Hunter Massif, is that the MIS-2 or the, the mapped MIS-2 ice limits actually did not inundate uh, the Gray Hunter Massif, but rather wrapped around it and filled this complex uh, topographic landscape, filled the valleys, flowed around it with multiple ice flow directions. The MIS-6 or the presumed MIS-6 glaciation and older glaciations very likely did at least partially inundate this landscape. So we have a landscape that in this case escaped glaciation. And so our initial motivation here was to go to a landscape where we have, um, and I'm putting in air quotes, hopefully everybody can see me, putting in quotes, um, simpler glaciers from which we may be able to extract temperature and precipitation information in terms of their paleoclimatic response. But to do that, we need to develop a chronology of those landforms. And so also looking at this perspective image, from Google Earth, what we see is a complex set of landscapes. We have a set of outer moraines that are sometimes at the valley head, sometimes in this case, a lateral moraine associated with those outer moraines um, at the mouths of the valley. And then at the head walls of the valley, we have a set of inner moraines that are just beyond the Little Ice Age limit and modern rock glaciers in this landscape. We see we have uh, relatively tall cirque headwalls relative to the basins, and we see that um, there's not a huge amount of difference in terms of the inner versus outer moraines in terms of boulder appearance, um, but we do see slightly more embedded boulders on the inner moraines. They are less weathered and generally less lichen covered than the outer moraines. This is a very approximate classification scheme in this case. We do a little bit of mapping. Again, our outer moraines are shown in orange. Our inner moraines are shown in purple. And they're generally hypothesized to be marine isotope stage two, kind of canonical last glacial maximum. The inner moraines being uh, terminal um, Pleistocene, very earliest Holocene. So just as we're transitioning out of um, uh, the last glacial maximum into Holocene-like conditions. And these are going to be important because this is our basis, this is our working hypothesis for assessing the robustness of our chronology. So if we quickly look at the data, um, in this case, in the form of a box and whisker plot, um, what we see again, color-coded by outer and inner moraines, is that the outer moraines uh, predominantly are, uh, uh, so 
actually, I'm going to back up here. Uh, exposure age on the Y. On the X axis are the groupings shown in this map figure here. And I've grouped them first by the moraine and the classification as to inner or outer, and then the nuclide uh, that was measured on those moraines. So all of the moraine sets have beryllium 10 measured in them. Only uh, a handful of them have carbon measured in them, and that's purely a byproduct of one having available material and two having available money. Um, <clears throat> What we see is that generally for any individual moraine set, we'll look at set number five right here, we see that the beryllium um, tends to be wider in terms of scatter or larger magnitude in terms of scatter relative to carbon, and that the median age, which is represented by this horizontal bar, is younger for carbon than it is for beryllium. The other thing we take away though, is that the median age for our carbon results, um, particularly for the outer moraine, are quite young and are often younger um, than the inner moraines from either carbon or beryllium. Take eight uh, moraine set 8C and moraine set 7C. And we see that there's quite a bit of scatter even in the carbon 14 results. So if we simply calculate based on beryllium alone, the median age for the outer moraine, it's 32,000 years, uh, or that's the approximate age of deposition, uh, and the inner moraine would be about 17,000 years. If we look at it a different way, and in this case, we're only looking at the carbon-14 results, what we're looking at here is a plot of elevation versus the concentration. The dashed contours are contours of equivalent exposure duration over a range of elevations. So what would the concentration be for a given, in this case, 12,000 years of exposure? The heavy black line is the saturation concentration or the steady state equilibrium concentration for carbon-14 over a range of elevations. The inner moraines here in purple display very tight clustering of apparent exposure ages just shy of 12,000 years. The outer moraines, on the other hand, are widely scattered. We have a predominance of ages that are widely scattered and younger than the inner moraines. However, we do have one saturated sample, and this would be suggestive of of an, an, a bit of antiquity for this outer moraine, at least about 30,000 years of continuous exposure. So what we're left with is somewhat inconclusive results for either nuclide set, and generally it's somewhat unsatisfactory overall. So what I want to do, and I, I have a sense we're only going to get to uh, Gray Hunter given timelines, is dive into the cosmogenic toolbox that we have at hand. So for any given moraine data set, we have four possibilities to explain the spread in ages. We can have exposure ages that are younger than the true depositional age as a result of erosion of the boulder surfaces that we sampled, right? We're not going to consider this further. And the reason being is that we have a uniform sampling of lithology in this case. And so it's very likely that if there is um, erosion of the boulder surface, and there almost certainly is, it is affecting all of the samples uniformly, right? It will have less of an effect on carbon-14 than it will beryllium-10, purely because of uh, nuclear decay systematics. And that effect on carbon-14 is so small that it cannot explain the very young apparent carbon-14 ages. So we're going to discount this possibility further. We have exposure ages that are younger than the true depositional age because of significant amounts of exhumation from within the moraine itself. So we're going to explore that possibility. We can have uh, beryllium-10 ages that are older than the depositional age due to inheritance of nuclides from prior exposure. This is very much a, a likely possibility, particularly if we quickly go back to our box and whisker plot, where we, in some cases, we have very old, uh, nearly 80,000 year apparent beryllium-10 exposure ages. 
The question then becomes, do we also have inheritance within the C14 data set that might explain that one saturated sample uh, shown here in the right? Um, or do we just have exposure ages and therefore moraine ages that reflect real climatic processes leading to moranal deposition? So if we look at this in terms of our paired nuclide plot, we see that our inner moraines are somewhat depressed relative to continuous exposure, but generally they are all consistent. Uh, and these are two sigma error ellipses around these values I should mention, um, are all consistent with continuous exposure. We have two outer moraine samples that are consistent with continuous exposure, one being very young, one being quite a bit older. And then the rest of the samples are consistent with complex exposure histories for these samples. Either they were prior exposed and then buried, or they have been exhumed subsequently on the moraine surface. So um, uh, Lizzie should recognize one of these figures because it's, it's borrowed from her paper. Um, these are two papers that came out uh, in 2020 and 2021, and they really inspired a lot of the thought moving forward in this paper. So thanks to Lizzie and thanks to, to Dirk uh, in particular, if he's on this call, I'm not sure if he is. Um, <clears throat> but we got to think about where are moraine boulders being sourced from? And there's two main possibilities. One, they are sourced uh, from a superglacial standpoint, uh, in this case, rockfall onto the glacier surface. Um, if we use Dirk's figure here, we have some degree of hill slope erosion. We have a rockfall event. We have some duration of end glacial transport where we consider there to be no accumulation of nuclides. And then we have some degree of superglacial uh, transport in the ablation zone prior to sampling. And in this case, they are sampling um, within a um, medial moraine, but it could be sampling within a moraine surface itself. So both of these papers were considering uh, these scenarios. The other source of potential boulders is that of being subglacially derived of plucking. And so if we think about glacier advance, we have a period of time in which um, the boulders or the, the uh, to be erratic surfaces uh, are exposed as bedrock or, or in this case, or potentially boulders upstream in the glacial valley before they are subglacially entrained and then transported to the moraine surface. So that's going to guide the exploration of a few very simple models to try and explain our data. And to get at this, I'm pulling from one of my favorite papers by Steve Porter. We have to think about what is average? What is our average state of glaciers? Is it the last glacial maximum? Is it the Holocene? Or is it somewhere in between? And Steve, uh, in my opinion, convincingly argues that it's somewhere in between. We have some degree of ice cover uh, in the broader landscape from the Cordillera and Ice Sheet, but probably also by alpine glaciers. And this again is supported by, uh, by Julian's modeling work, um, looking at the duration of glaciation of these landscapes. And we see that in, in many regions, especially anything but um, the central um, domal regions of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet, um, we have relatively short-lived periods of ice cover on the order of tens to 20,000 years. And so if we think over an entire glacial cycle, we have a large period of time in which to accumulate carbon-14 and potentially accumulate carbon-14 at its saturation concentration. So that's going to be one of our end members in these next models. So what I've done here is I've assumed two distinct sources of boulders to the moraines, one by subglacial plucking during ice advance, the other by rockfall onto a glacier surface, transport down glacier to the ultimate moraine deposition. I've picked average elevations for the elevation of the, the surface prior to being plucked. I've used the average elevation of the uh, rims of the cirques. And then I've used the average elevation for the outer moraines that we looked at. Contoured 
is the carbon-14 concentration in this case. Um, and this is purely hypothetical. And so what we are looking at here and the why is either the timing or plucking, uh, timing of plucking or the timing of rockfall, and then the depositional age of the moraine. One of the main takeaways here is that in nearly all cases, the concentration is set not by the degree of inheritance, but rather by the depositional age of the moraine itself. And what comes out of this is that it's actually either scenario is unable to generate our saturation concentration given a uh, reasonable range of depositional ages for our inner or outer moraine. So if we assume about an MIS-2 age for the outer moraines and an MIS-1 age for the inner moraines, we can't generate compatible concentrations. The only way we can generate compatible concentrations for either of these scenarios is to have very, very young um, outer moraine ages on the order of about 9,000 years. And so generally that is incompatible with the broad base of literature um, within the Yukon territories for the age of, of these moraines. Sorry. So, uh, um, so again, if we look at these concentrations, uh, there we go, sorry, my pointer froze. Um, what we see uh, in this case for the outer moraines are concentrations on the order of two to three times 10 to the five. Um, <clears throat> and so we would need very young for both scenarios, 10,000 year depositional ages for our outer moraines. So it becomes very hard to explain um, the saturated concentration other than a very old depositional age for that sample. So the concentration that we measure, in other words, and I'm trying to say more clearly, is set not by the pre-exposure history of this boulder, but rather the depositional age of the moraine. So it's very likely that this erratic sample in this outer moraine has been sitting at the surface in this moraine in a stable position for more than 30,000 years, uh, very approximately, right? So we still have to explain all of these very young apparent exposure ages. To do so, we're going to look at the opposite scenario where we have exhumation from the moraine itself. What I've done here is I've assumed a depositional age uh, or the, the depositional age of the moraine is the sum of the amount of time since the boulder reached the surface of that moraine as it's been exhuming out, plus the exhumation, uh, the duration that it's been exhuming out of that moraine. I very simply assumed that the moraine in this case is infinitely flat so we have no production coming from the side. There are models that have modeled this, um, but it became overkill in this situation. And then I've assumed typical densities for the moraine material itself. So I'm assuming a simple vertical trajectory of the boulder out of the moraine as it's exhuming. Um, and I've also assumed in this case that there is production by muons um, at a, a relative rate um, for carbon that is greater than it is for beryllium. So in this case, um, our, our muon concentrations or our muon production rates are modeled explicitly um, for this exhuming moraine. What we see in this case is we use, in this case, our saturated sample as our upper limit on compatible scenarios. So we're saying that the outer moraines need to have been in place for at least 35,000 years, right? And so that means that the sum again of these two scenarios needs to be at least 35,000 years. So the sum of the exposure duration and the exhumation duration needs to be 35,000 years. These other black lines are contours of the concentration as measured in an individual boulder sample. Everything in the orange shading are compatible scenarios of exhumation depths from which that top surface was exhumed from of the boulder over given pairs of exposure and exhumation duration. So anything in white 
is incompatible with this scenario. Any place that the black contours cross the orange shading is compatible, right? And what we see for at least the outer moraines are that our results are consistent with more than two meters of exhumation of many of our boulder surfaces over at least 35,000 years. And I say at least 35,000 years because again, we lose age information when we reach steady state equilibrium. What this then means is that our very young apparent C14 ages suggest that the boulders that we sampled, right, reached the surface of these moraines sometimes during the early to mid Holocene, right? And this is, believe it or not, consistent with evidence for Arctic wide um, erosional or deflational event that's tied to rapid thaw of permafrost um, into the Holocene and then subsequent solar fluxion of those surfaces. Right. So what I hope I've shown here is that we can tease out some additional information. We do have to make some assumptions. But in this case, carbon 14 has provided us with a means to make end member assumptions about what the starting concentration is or what the minimum age of a moraine surface uh, is in this case. So if we come back to our goals, which I think we're just going to have to stick with Gray Hunter, which is ultimately that, um, that of chronology, is that our, the inner moraines, based on the carbon-14 and the tight clustering that we have, date to the latest Pleistocene and earliest Holocene. There is beryllium um, that is inherited from prior exposure, and given the results of carbon-14 and beryllium-10, there's no evidence for strong degrees of post-depositional modification of these surfaces. The outer moraines suffer from both effects of inheritance as well as post-depositional modification, and that ultimately um, the outer moraines in this case likely date to at least MIS-3, possibly MIS-4, right? But this brings up the question, where is the last glacial maximum or MIS-2 moraines? Because they are present um, in this region in other uh, locations. And so the hypothesis here is that of moisture starvation at the LGM. So this is a fantastic sensitivity analysis model uh, by Loferstrom and Liaka. Um, and what it is showing by and large, and I'll just summarize it rather than, than have everybody look at the figure, is that the presence of the Laurentide and the Cordilleran ice sheet leads to massive decreases at the LGM in both uh, the temperature associated uh, at Gray Hunter Massif. And this, uh, these curves, by the way, are from the Trace 21K uh, reanalysis data products. This is a transient simulation uh, from the last glacial maximum to the present. Our very, very cold temperatures at Gray Hunter Massif, um, a, a depression of 15 degrees. And on average, it's about 10 degrees Celsius is the, uh, the mean annual temperature, or I'm sorry, minus 10 degrees Celsius is the mean annual temperature. So very, very cold conditions at the last glacial maximum and very, very dry conditions, only about 40% of the modern precipitation. So what we potentially have here is starvation of these glaciers of moisture. And that in this case, it is possible that while there was a last glacial maximum advance, it may have been overridden by the subsequent latest Pleistocene, earliest Holocene advance when there was an increase in precipitation to these glaciers, potentially leading to a positive mass balance. This is also supported by uh, uh, carbon uh, content. Uh, in this case, this is a fantastic study by a master's student at University of Alberta. Um, and they were looking at what is the carbon and nitrogen and stable isotope uh, composition of um, ice wedge polygons in this case. And ice wedge is preserved in, in the Yukon. And again, what they see is um, carbon percent carbon content indicative of um, a healthy vegetated landscape a very dry landscape during MIS-2. And during MIS-3, we have elevated precipitation again, uh, leading to vegetation that probably is uh, existing within a similar 
um, overall temperature regime, much like today or potentially slightly cooler, that would lead to um, these larger advances of moraines, uh, larger advances of glaciers to the outer moraine positions. So uh, I had hoped to get through the second scenario. Uh, I completely and utterly failed. Um, so I think I'm going to stop at this point uh, and take any questions uh, that the audience may have. Uh, and thank you again so much. It's uh, been a blast and I'm sure the questions will be fantastic as well. Okay, so Thank you very much, Ben, for this really, really uh, fun talk. Um, I'm thinking that people are probably still typing in their questions. And while they're doing so, I'll, I'll try and ask the first question. And uh, mine is, um, uh, has to do with, with a bit of the um, guts and insights of the cosmogenic um, carbon. How sensitive is it to, to burial, basically? So when you're taking a you're looking at, at, at carbon-14 age, how do you account for the fact that it might have spent some time, that, that a big portion of it might have been produced during burial, or maybe it's just not as sensitive? Yeah, no, that's a, whoa, that was very loud. <laughs> that's a fantastic uh, question, and it is something we do have to account for, and so that's why in, uh, if I go back a few slides, in this exhumation model, we do account for production while it is exhuming out of the moraine itself um, at those elevated production rates um, because of the, the large mu, mu I'm going to say muogenic, Greg Balco is going to kill me, large muogenic component uh, that is uh, responsible for C14 production. Um, if I had gotten to my next mini talk, um, which may be an entire talk on its own, um, we do also account for production by muons in that sense. So it is important to account. It's not something we can neglect anymore, that we can't just say it's buried, there's no production, we can ignore it. If we do ignore production, let's say we're buried under 20 meters of ice, which is a, a safe-ish assumption, um, although there's work coming out very soon out of Antarctica by, by Ryan Venturelli, who you should get as a speaker, uh, um, that's showing that we, we do even under 20 or 30 meters of glacier ice have to account for production of carbon. Um, but if we assume there's no production of carbon, we can detect on, on the order of seven to 800 years of burial is when we can separate it from continuous exposure based on analytical uncertainties. So it's complicated. <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> that's, I guess it's complicated is a good answer. Um, we have our first uh, question from Aryan. Um, so he says, cold and dry for LGM. Sounds familiar, and familiar for, for, from other regions as well, e.g. Central Asia. Could the glaciers have been entirely cold based and not left much of an imprint? Yeah, I, Arian, I think you're you're spot on there. Um, in that, yeah, they may not have left an imprint at all. And I think Central Asia is a, a good example of of. I think we need to systematically look at a lot of our data sets um, globally and kind of reassess what actually is the landform signal um, that's left behind by these glaciers, and then what is the resulting um, cosmogenic signal that would be extracted from these, these landforms. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. Um, and so the LGM may not have left an imprint at all. Like, like you said, there may not be a moraine at all. So I think, I think when, as, as I'm working on this paper, we're hedging our bets and saying there either was no moraine left behind or it's been overwritten. Okay, so um, um, Pierre, do you want to take the next question? Yeah, there's a next question by uh, Craig Lee uh, saying, and I apologize for the amateurish question, but how are you we measuring C14 in inorganic material? Yeah, fantastic question, Craig. So in this case, this is 
uh, carbon-14 that is produced in situ in quartz grains um, by cosmic rays. This process does also happen in uh, organic material, say a piece of charcoal um, that, that an archaeologist might, might work with. Um, so what we, this is all intracrystalline uh, hosted carbon-14 in this case. And so it is produced on an oxygen-16 nucleus principally by the interaction of a cosmic ray with that nucleus. And so we actually have a transformation of oxygen-16 to carbon-14, um, and it's subsequently then hosted in the inorganic quartz um, that we then uh, extract. And there's a variety of methods for getting this carbon-14 out of quartz, um, but they all involve heat and then cryogenic collection of that subsequent carbon dioxide. Th hopefully that answered the question, Craig. So it, it's all produced in the inorganic materials. Um, I mentioned that it is produced in organic materials. So it's actually all being produced in all of us, all 51 of us right now on the phone call. It's just that we're respiring so much atmospheric carbon dioxide that it completely obliterates and drowns out um, the cosmogenic signal. Thanks, it's, it's a ni nice illustration. Uh, I just have one question also coming back to, um, to the question of uh, iron also. Um, have you done aluminum 26 dating on those borders or did they get something different in terms of message compared to beryllium 10 or something complementary to the other nuclides? We have not measured aluminum in any of these erratics. And um, part of that was a lack of foresight on our part. So when we did the chemistry, we did not um, take any aliquots that would be required for an aluminum analysis. Um, and we have some material left, so we could go back. Um, I would suspect um, they would also show complex exposure, but on it would be relative to much longer time scales. We certainly wouldn't see it from um, the last uh, interglacial to the present, it would be spanning a much longer period of time. Um, other studies, and, and I apologize, Arian, I don't know if you've measured aluminum on some of those samples. I think you have, but certainly John Goss has done some work in this area as well, and they have measured aluminum, and they do see um, isotope ratios consistent with, with complex exposure. Okay, thanks. So uh, in the meantime, I might ask just uh, another question. Um, and if anybody wants to ask them, just personally uh, make sure you raise your hand in the reaction and we'll ask you to unmute. Um, in the meantime, do you think that some of the, on the difference in exposure patterns can be can be a, a product of, of different erosional patterns? So, um, landslides, it might not be right for glacial um, area, glacial areas, but um, so I don't know, a, a, an influx of, of very young material, which is then reflected in, in younger uh, carbon-14 ages. Yeah, I think it's certainly a possibility. And it's one of the reasons when we did um, kind of approximate that situation, um, in the rockfall scenario. So let's say we have um, some deglacial release of the landscape uh, 10,000 years ago. Um, it ends up not having a strong influence on the resulting uh, measured concentration. Um, it's still predominantly controlled by the deposition age. But yeah, that would be, you know, that's where you would want to really just be become the geomorphologist to look for these influences. I think, Lizzie, if I remember correctly, you probably saw some of that influence in your work in the Himalaya, um, where and, and even in, in um, the Alaska range, uh, there's fantastic preservation of large rock avalanches and landslides across the glacier surface itself. Um, and that could have a resultant impact on sediment volumes being deposited in the moraine and the subsequent um, cosmogenic signal that would get measured. 
Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Um, so any any other questions? Um, well, oh, right. So uh, one more question by uh, Isabel. I saw you sampled bedrock surfaces as well from one of your figures. Um, any difference in concentrations with boulders? So would that be, Isabel, is it this figure here? Just want to make sure I'm, I'm going to the correct figure. Uh, okay, yeah, this is not actually my work. This is Aryan's work. Um, and they, depending on the bedrock and if Arian's still on the call, he could probably answer better than me. Uh, they do see differences. Um, we didn't sample any bedrock surfaces. Um, but elsewhere, for example, when we do work in the Antarctic, uh, we do see differences between erratics sitting on top of the bedrock surface. And so one of the other things we're teasing out is there we actually can see some carbon-14 inheritance but it's on the order of a couple of percent of the total concentration. And we're actually using that to tease out how long ice was uh, covering a site. So if we, if we did have infinite funds and we're able to sample the bedrock, I think we would see some differences um, in, in even the carbon-14 signal. But in this case, we, we, don't, we only have uh, boulder samples. There's one more question in the in the chat by Adam Hawkins. So yeah. After the great, the great saga, would you advocate for making the norm to measure paired nuclides on more and boulders, or keep it to only specific sites? So, Adam, I should ask this when you defend your PhD here in the next year or so, uh, since I'm on your committee. Um, <laughs> What um, it's it's a fantastic and interesting question because in the early days, and I'm now old enough to say, in the early days, we did advocate for for that very technique, and then it went away for a bit. And I would say, in a perfect world, yes, because I think there's so much more process information that can be gleaned on top of the chronology information. But I think, and I would say, particularly in these more complicated landscapes where you may not have um, highly erosive um, glacial regimes, absolutely yes. I think if you're working, say, in the Southern Alps of New Zealand, you are potentially um, okay with a single nuclide. Um, but in these more complicated regimes, I would say, yes, multiple nuclides, um, depending on the time scale of your interest, are, are highly recommended. That would be my politically correct answer. Okay, um, well, if there are no more questions, I want to say thank you again for everybody who came to listen to this talk. And thank you very much, Brent, for giving this wonderful talk. And uh, hopefully you, you will join us again uh, next week. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.